morning, everybody. My name is Joel, I'm one of the pastors here at Hope. Just want to say welcome. So glad that everybody's here with us this morning. Um, and I appreciate y'all's patience and bearing with us as we're kind of using this small little TV. Um, we've been working all week trying to figure out, if you were here with us last Sunday, you know that the projector went out the morning of, and so we didn't have any slides or anything. So I've been like, my 11-year-old daughter and I were in the attic on Friday night at that little hole up there where the projector comes out of, and it's like a death trap. And you have to lower the projector down by a rope. And it's crazy. It's, and we, like all week, we've been trying to figure it out and having different people come in and take a look, and they're like, and then Micah came in this morning, because Micah was in Africa last week, and so he got back in town, and he came in this morning, he's like, oh, it's just because you updated the OS like software on the computer. It's just the projector can't handle it, that's all. I was like, oh, that would have been good to know before uh, the entire week spent crawling on my belly through the attic trying to figure out the projector situation. So I appreciate y'all's patience. Um, uh, you know, it says, I love, though, here at Hope, we can do this because we're not about big production and all types of things. We believe in just excellence and simplicity, and that's what we stay true to. And so... Um, anyways, like I said, my name's Joel, one of the pastors here. So glad that you're here with us this morning. If you've been with us the last kind of four or five weeks, um, you know that we have gotten done with our kind of vision series that we've been walking through. And we've been looking at this word Edenic. And what does it mean to live Edenic? And as we've been walking through it together, we found that to live Edenic is simply put, everything that we say and everything that we do breathes life into the world for the glory of God. That's it. That's what it means to live Edenic. And so we're going on this journey together. It's not a series. It's not, it's, it's not just like a one-year vision thing. Like we are stepping into this journey together as a body and walking in this direction of what it means to live Edenic. And kind of the, the subtitle of this that we're walking into is a renovation of faith. And so a lot of it is we're going to be going back to the basics. Now, it's so imperative that we have a proper understanding of Scripture, understanding what they are, and, and so that we can become intimately engaged with them, not, not just familiar with them, not just kind of like, yeah, I kind of know a little bit of that, but like intimately engaged to where we raise what's called our gospel fluency, right? Right? And so that we can start to kind of articulate and communicate with, with more confidence to a, to a world that's lost the truth of the gospel and the hope that's in it. And so there's people in our body, there's people in just the church at large that are really just at a place where they're just, they're questioning and they're struggling in faith. And, and some, for some, some call it a faith crisis, others may not go that far, but just kind of wrestling with some things. And I find that when that happens, it's so important, just like if you've ever played sports, um, you know that the kind of the best players and the best teams are the ones that really like master the fundamentals, the basics. And a lot of times coaches, like if kind of things are off kilter with the team, they'll go back to the basics and make sure that everything, the, the base level, the foundation is solid and then start to build up from there. We've been looking through kind of uh, this renovation of faith, we've been kind of like likening it to renovating a house. And similarly, um, with a house, if there's a crack in the wall, you can fix the crack, right? Um, you can plaster it, paint it, it's fine. But if something's wrong with the foundation, that crack's just gonna come back again, bigger and worse than before, right? So we have to get to the root, and so that's kind of what we're doing. Um, the reason I stopped there is I'm like looking at the cracks in the wall and I'm thinking, hmm, and we need to look at the foundation of this building. Um, anyways, that's neither here nor there. Um, one of the biggest challenges, though, and we're going to be looking at Genesis 1 today. We're going to be walking through it together. Genesis 1 tends to be, and I kind of talked about this last Sunday. Genesis 1 tends to be this passage that people go to, and they kind of turn it into something that it's not intended to be, wasn't meant to be. And it's largely people attempt to, what we said last week, shoehorn science into it. Now, 
One of the biggest challenges in the world today, and interfacing with the world and with a lot of believers, is that many people feel as though science and faith are at odds with one another, that they're opponents. And it's tragic, because instead, instead of rejoicing and celebrating in responsible, humane, scientific discovery, we often tend to view it as a and instead of viewing it as really a gift from God. And this made it, for me, incredibly difficult for so many years to really take the scripture seriously. Just full transparency. It was, it was hard for me for a long time because I believed the Bible, but I also believed in a, lo a lot of science, and I, and I loved science, and I, I had people kind of in, in certain camps telling me, like, it, you, it's one or the other. Like, you can't have science and faith, and that, that couldn't be further from the truth. It really could not be further from the truth. And so for a long time, I kind of felt like, am I a heretic, or like, is something wrong, or, you know, just feeling less than, because for me, science has always just attested to the wonder and the beauty of God and the way he's created everything. It's incredible to be able to learn the processes and things. When I think about this, there's, so... In ancient Rome, the concrete that they used is a type of concrete that's been marbled at for centuries. And the reason being is that uh, Roman concrete, ancient Roman concrete, has this characteristic or this quality where as the, brick, as the bricks form cracks in them, over time, a lot of them will start to heal and the crack goes away. And instead of breaking down more, it kind of like fortifies itself. And so that's like perplexed scientists for just recently kind of got to the core of what's happening there. And the limestone in that part of the world at that time that they would use in their concrete mixture, as it would crack, the cracks would generally form along where the limestone shards were in the concrete. And so when the rain would come and it would get into those cracks, since I'm not a scientist, I'm going to say, it kind of like melted the limestone, and then it filled in those cracks and, and like re-glued it back together, and the blocks essentially healed themselves. It's fascinating. That's a really fascinating thing, right? And we could look at those blocks and just go, wow, those blocks are just healing themselves. Or we could rejoice and celebrate in the fact that there's people way smarter than me that have gone and, and learned the process. And in learning the process by which this happens doesn't say that God's not behind that process, that he didn't write that process. And so there's so many things in science that we see as a threat when in reality, no, it's just, we're just learning some of the processes by which God has created and chosen to do things. It's really a beautiful thing. So we need to stop viewing it as this kind of threat or opponent to faith. Because here's the thing, scientific merit, it can only be possible if results from experiments can be replicated, right? They have to be able to be done over and over, producing the same results, for example, we know that gravity is a really solid scientific theory. It's very valid. Why? Because have you ever dropped something and it didn't fall to the ground? If you did, that's weird. We, every, we drop something, it falls. We know it's a, it's a valid theory, right? And so ev evidence like this gives us a deeper understanding of the importance of order in the world. Order. You know who loves order? He created it. He authored order. So it's like we're taking this entire field that values logic and order and reason and throwing it all out because some people don't believe that God is behind it. And while that's sad, we as apprentices of Jesus, we know, we can celebrate and rejoice that we know that God is behind this. God is the one who has authored these things and designed these processes to happen. So we find joy and wonderment and confidence in the discovery. How do we know that God loves order? Well, let's get into it. Genesis 1, verses 1 through 3. Now, real quick, side note, up until June, we're going to be going through Genesis chapter 1 through 11, pretty granular. Like, we're going to be getting pretty specific with some things throughout Genesis 1 through 11. Because, and I said this last week, but Genesis 1 through 11, if we have that down, if we're really, really familiar and intimately engaged with Genesis 1 through 11, 
the rest of Scripture kind of serves as a commentary on that. We see the playing out of what happens in Genesis 1 through 11 all through the rest of Scriptures. Everything starts to make a little more sense and start to fall into place when we start to view it through that lens. So we're going to be kind of getting a little granular in 1 through 11 up to June, and then we'll kind of pick up the pace a little bit, okay? So today, we're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. It says this, In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep. While a wind from God, or the Spirit of God, swept or hovered over the face of the waters, then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And so it continues on. In day one, we see light separated from darkness. We see night and day. In day two, we see the waters below separated from the waters above, and the sky created Day three, we see the seas and the earth, and then vegetation and fruit trees. It's really cool if you look at day three, and then day six, there's kind of an extra part of creation. There's like an extra little blessing that's on day three and day six, which is really important for the ancient Hebrews at the time. The seas and the earth, vegetation and fruit trees on day three. Day four, we have the sun, moon, and stars, creatures and birds in the sky, and day six. bringing order to the cosmos. God bringing order to the cosmos. Now, when we look at this passage, and as we're going through and we're going back to the fundamentals, what we're going to be talking through is we're going to be talking through some things. For a long time, I was, I was made to believe or, or led to believe or chose to believe that there was just one way to view everything. And in some things, that's the case. When we look at the divinity of Christ, we look at the trinitarian nature of God, we look at these things, there's there's one way. But when we look at certain parts of Scripture, there is valid biblical evidence for just kind of a, a number of different ways to look at it. And it's really beautiful. It shouldn't intimidate us. It's a really beautiful thing. And so we look at Genesis chapter 1. There's a ton of schools of thought about what's happening here in Genesis 1 and then Genesis 2. But there's two major schools of thought, okay? These are the two major schools of thought. The first one is those who, we call this, you may have heard this as young earth creation. So we see this as all happening at once in six literal 24-hour days, somewhere around six to 10,000 years ago, okay? Now this school of thought, if you're there, there's totally plausible biblical evidence for that. It's totally valid. There's another major school of thought in Genesis 1 of of those who see verses 1 and 2 as the starting point about 4.5 billion years ago, like science largely attests. Verse 3 being when God begins to bring order to the cosmos sometime after that. Now, both of these views are beautiful. Both of these views have an incredible amount of biblical and scholarly support. It's all good. The beautiful thing is it's not primary. It has no salvific importance for us. Is is it literal 24-hour days? Is it like long periods of time? Is it the day-age thing? It's it's fun to talk about and think about. It doesn't matter really in the end. It really doesn't. But some people, and this is why I'm bringing this into a Sunday morning message, so many people see this as being something primary, and it will hold them up from really giving their lives to Christ and, and really, like, moving forward in the faith. It, it really did me for a long, long time. And so that's why I bring it in. I'm not trying to give, like, a science lecture or anything, but I think it's really important for us to talk through. And when we kick out, when we roll out in the fall, we're doing theology and spiritual formation classes. We're going to be talking about a lot of this stuff on a way deeper, more detailed level. It's going to be really fun if you're a nerd like me and you like that kind of stuff. So, anyways, I tend to lean more toward the second school of thought. And here's why. Many people view Genesis 1 as just a creation account. And that's not necessarily wrong. In fact, it's it's true. It is a creation account. However, in order 
to really appreciate what's happening here, I think it's important for us to strip off our modern lenses and put on our ancient lenses. As foggy as they can get sometimes, put on our ancient lenses and try to view it through those lenses. Now, to the ancient Hebrews, when they heard the word created, they don't hear it, they didn't hear it the same way we hear the word created. For the ancient Hebrews, something was not created until it was given function. Okay? So, this Breedlove guitar, Micah, where'd you get it at? Do you remember? Corner music. Okay. So, it was like hanging up on the wall somewhere, and you like took it down, tried it out, sound really pretty. So, when this was hanging in Corner Music, when this was made at, at Breedlove's factory and it was brought to Corner Music, it was not created yet to the ancient Hebrew. Once Micah got it, purchased it, brought it home and started playing it, then it's created. It's, it's kind of hard for us to wrap our minds around it first, but as you start to think about it, so they see created as being more given function in order to. So, with this understanding, the ancient Hebrews more than likely would not have been viewing the creation account as we would typically be viewing it per se, at least as, not really as we would view it. We tend to view this, this passage as nothing existed until God is creating it in these passages. The ancient Hebrews would have been reading this more as a temple account of God designing for himself and ordering for himself a temple in the cosmos. Both people believing that God created all of it. That's not the question. How did he create it? Did he create it? No, they know God created all of this. It's just a matter of when and how would be the difference between the way the ancients would be reading this and the way we read it now. So, when the ancient Hebrews would be looking at the creation account, and in your Bible it probably says, the, the subtitle, or like the little heading probably says creation account, and then uh, chapter two says another creation account, or another account of creation. Um, so when we look at that, we traditionally view this as just a creation account. So, if we can look through our ancient lenses for a moment, there's an Old Testament scholar that puts it beautifully, John Walton, where he says this. To the ancient Hebrews, when they looked at the creation account, it'd be similar to me and uh, John. We are going to go to a play, okay? And we're going to go to uh, the local theater, wherever that is, and we're going to go see uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. Is that a play? Yeah, that's the one I always have like seen. Um, so yeah, we're going to see a Midsummer Night's Dream. Me and John, okay? We love that play. We love it. And so um, I get there on time. Starts at seven. I get there. John's late. He's like forty-five minutes late. So I'm sitting there. I'm watching the play. John comes in about forty-five minutes late. He's scooching through. Hey, sorry, sorry. Excuse me. Yeah, sorry. He sits down next to me. Right? He's like, Hey, dude. Sorry, I got stuck, stuck in traffic on sixty-five. Uh, what's going on, man? I wouldn't then go, well, the columns were made of mahogany, designed in this way, in this, by this thing, with th these materials holding it together. Uh, the, the floor is comprised of white oak. The, I wouldn't be going through that. I wouldn't worry with that. We already know that this thing has been built and created, and it's beautiful. It's okay. What he wants to know is where are we at in the story? What's happening? Why are we here? So then I would go, well, this guy came on the scene, did this thing, this other dude came on, they got in this argument, this lady came in, and all of a sudden, and then now we're here. And then he's like, okay, sweet, all right, let's go from here. That's how the ancient Hebrews would have more than likely been viewing this temple account, this creation account in Genesis. What happened? Why did God bring order to everything? What is the purpose of this order? Who are we? Why are we here? What's the purpose? Now, that gets uncomfortable for some people because they see that interpretation, that way of viewing it as a threat to the way that we've traditionally been taught to believe. 
Because the temptation is for us, and I'll say it again, is for us to try to turn this book into a science book and to try to get scientific truth out of it when that was never what it was intended to do. It's not its purpose. So we can let the good gift of responsible, humane science provide some really cool discovery in those areas, but our focus is on what's at the heart of all of this, the truth propositions that are being made. It does not make this any less true if we don't view it as a science book. In fact, we begin handling the scriptures responsibly when we understand that its purpose is to introduce us to the creator of the universe and inform us about his plan for rescue and redemption and better understand our role in that plan. How do we operate within that? And it starts with him bringing order to the cosmos. And that is the very order that we disrupted. It's the very order we disrupted. We've been talking about this. We talked about the Edenic Covenant a couple weeks ago. And I don't say that for shame or guilt's sake, but just re uh, reality's sake. This is the way it played out. God brought perfect order to the universe, to earth. We disrupted the order. The Edenic Covenant, God said, look, listen, Adam, you can eat any tree in this garden. Tree of life, have eternal life, be here with me, perfect fellowship forever. It's going to be beautiful. You can eat all of the tree of perfect mercy, perfect justice, perfect, remember all that we were talking about? And then we said, he said, just do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, okay? You, you're a free will being, so there's that choice there. And my desire is that you choose to be in relationship with me. But I'm, I'm begging you, please don't eat from that. Because when you do, you're going to bring in sp spiritual and physical death into the world. God didn't break the covenant, right? We keep saying that. God didn't break the covenant. He held up his end. His end still holds true. He still desires to be with us in the garden. We disrupted that order. So it's not the how he created and ordered everything we need to be concerned with in Genesis 1. It's the why. Why does God care about order? Why is he so opposed to chaos? Because chaos is opposed to God's character. Chaos, confusion, disorder is opposed to God's character. We serve a God of order. And he uses that order to bring peace into the world and into our lives. We serve a God of order. When Paul is writing the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, they're, they're going through this thing where it's like they're just having insanity in their church services. There's like spiritual gifts happening and people talking in tongues and people who don't speak the same language are like talking over each other and people are all trying to kind of like fight for their spot to, to, to talk and, and it's crazy. It's like The View. If you've ever seen The It's like in Corinth. It's like, I can't believe I just said that. But it's kind of like they're like talking over each other. It's all this craziness. So Paul's writing to the church. And he's saying, he, he's, he's giving them some, some just good wisdom and advice. And so this, con this, this passage is written in the context of being spoken into how they are operating their order of service as they're meeting as a church, corporately. But Paul makes a claim in chapter 14, verse 33, that transcends just this moment and tells us about the character of God. It says, for God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. Your translation might say, for God is not a God of chaos or confusion, but of peace or order. God is the author of order. It's why everything in the universe works so perfectly. Micah, you do such a good job, man, at picking, like, the song. It's insane. Because as we're, like, the one song is like, talking about this thing. And we hadn't had a conversation. It's just like, he knows the passage. He goes, researches it, and does. It's beautiful. So thank you. Because it, it, it talks about this. That the planets and the stars and logic and reason, all of these things work from a place of order that God authored. They have to work from a place of order. They cannot operate apart from God's perfect order and how he created them to function. 
Seven times in Genesis 1, scriptures say God saw it was good, right? We know that, and, and God saw that it was good, and God saw that it was good. When we look at that word good, it we, can, can kind of seem like, dude, you just created planets. It's just good, right? In our modern, like, good idea. It's yet another, like, failure of the English language. It's, it's tough uh, to really capture what that good is means. That good is the Hebrew word tov, T-O-V. And when God is, it's saying that God saw that it was good. It goes so much deeper than good. For me, like, with the way we use good is like, is Hattie B's good? Yeah, it's good. But I prefer Bolton's hot chicken. Yeah, I do. I prefer Bolton's. But Hattie B's is good. Works in a pinch, right? That's not, God's not like, okay, Saturn, you'll do. It's like, no, no, no. This is like perfect. It, it, and so the tov, the word tov, this good, is functional. Functioning perfectly how God created it to, per, to, to function. So we see that seven times in Genesis 1. And so again, I want to remind us, we are the disruptors of order. This order that's there we are the disruptors of it. And again, I'm going to say it, not for shame and guilt's sake. That's just to give us a good grasp of what happened here. Now, the question, and this is rhetorical. Don't raise your hands. You're going to have to shake your head. Just, okay. How many of you feel as though your lives are more marked by chaos than they are order? You didn't listen to my instructions, but I appreciate your transparency. How many of you feel like your lives are more marked by chaos than they are order? How does that feel when that happens? How does that feel when that is kind of the, the like main characteristic of our life, the way it's ordered? That is just chaos. It doesn't feel good. It leads to so many different issues. There's mental health issues. There's relational strain. There's physical illness. I know when my life is kind of in disarray and chaos, like which happens, I feel like every day, but I, I, I don't, we have five kids and it's crazy. Um, when it happens and when things are crazy at work and Tracy's work and we're like running around, I get a sinus infection, like boom, it hits me. And it tip, tip, typically tends to happen, my body hangs on until like everything's done and like we're in that, that busy season's over and then it's like, Okay, I'm going to lay down now for four days and not get up because I have a sinus infection. Does anybody else do that? You get like physically ill when kind of, yeah, it's really common. It's not good. We weren't created to be living in chaos. We were created for order. Order leads to peace and joy and life and flourishing. Now the temptation is to do exactly what messed everything up in the first place, to define order for ourselves. You see, tov and ra are the two Hebrew words for good and evil. And when we see the tree of knowledge of good and evil, we can see it as the tree of knowledge of tov and ra. And traditionally, we have kind of translated those as good and evil, which is, is fine. It works. It's great. That's their definition. But also a part of that is functional and dysfunctional. Function and dysfunction. And so we can see the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We could call it a.k.a. the tree of the knowledge of function and dysfunction. And so with that understanding, we can begin to understand a little bit better and start to view the evil that we see in the world that we've been talking about a lot. And, and it's just all around us, it's dysfunction. There has been a disruption in the order that God created. It is not functioning how he created it to function because we disrupted that order. That's evil that we see in the world. It's dysfunction. But just as Paul observed and critiqued, God does not desire for us to define order for ourselves or for him. When we try to define it for ourselves, we end up with chaos, utilizing God as just a cog in the machine of busyness. That's what happens when we try to define order for ourselves. 
we must be going to him to be able to have any hope for finding order in our lives and in the world. Listen, guys, this is, it's one of those things where we can make things so complicated and we can make faith so complicated But it gets down to, are we just abiding in Christ? Are, are, we, are we spending time with the Father? Are we sitting and just listening? I went to the, the kingdom on Monday, and I was talking to some buddies, um, and we were talking about prayer. And so often we, we fall victim to the idea that prayer is just us talking, 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 talking. But so much of prayer is listening, sitting and just being silent. And listening. Because here's the thing. As we listen for God's voice, as we listen to God, listen for him to move in us, there are things that will become clear that we need to do away with. If we listen, the Holy Spirit will bring those things to mind. Things that we need to do away with. If we listen, there's going to be things that we're going to realize that we need to spend more time doing. And if we listen, there's going to be things that come to mind that we need to spend less time doing. But we have to stop. We have to slow down. We have to listen. We have to ask and then listen. People tend to lean one way or the other. And we're about wrapped up. People tend to lean one way or the other. People who don't have any order in their lives at all. And then people who have way too much order, like way too rigid of order in their lives. Let's look just really quick at the perils of both. People who don't have any order, a lot of times their lives are marked by procrastination. Holler if you hear me. Yeah. Being overwhelmed. Scatterbrained. Dropping balls. Kind of like, oh crap, I was supposed to do that. I forgot, right? We know that. that for those of us who kind of struggle in that, like not having enough order, that can be the case. Now, the peril of having too much order is there can be, it's marked by rigidity. There's no flexibility. There's no room for spontaneity, no room for interruption. Everything that kind of gets in the way of that is a bother. And they're also marked, just like not having any order, they're also marked by being overwhelmed. Both of these camps breed chaos. Both of these ways of living with just no order at all and way too much order, they breed chaos. They breed dysfunction. Because neither one of them has God at the center of their order. Again, dude, you had no idea that I had this in the message. It's so beautiful. I just... Love the way the Spirit works. Colossians 1.17, speaking about the supremacy of Christ. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. We know that everything was created in him, through him, by him, for him. Jesus. In him all things hold together. He himself is before all things. We cannot find healthy order for our lives and in our world apart from Christ. Can't happen. Can't happen. Won't happen. We can kind of fake it for a little bit, but it's only a matter of time. It's that crack in the wall that we try to just spackle, paint over, and pretend like it wasn't there, right? It's what it is. Apart from Christ, we're not, we, we can't find order. And here's the thing. When we come to Jesus, Michael, you can come on up, man. When we come to Jesus, he is never going to just not give us any order at all. And he's never going to give us too much order. Because God's order is perfect. God's order is perfect. In Acts 17, Paul tells us this really beautiful thing in verse 24 through 29. He's talking, and, he, and he's talking at the Areopagus in, in Greece, and he's um, in Athens, and he's um, 
He's talking to these really, really smart people. And he says to them, God created us in the earth with plenty of space and time for living so that we could seek after God and not just grope around in the dark, but actually find him. I'll say that again, and I have a, I have a, I have a quick question. God created us and the earth and the universe, the cosmos, with plenty of space and time for living so we could seek after God and not just grope around in the dark, but actually find him. Now, here's the question. This is another rhetorical question. Don't raise your hand. How many of you, like me, have uttered the words, dude, there's just not enough time in the day. Yeah, there's just like not enough time. I have this and this and this and that. there's just not enough time. How in the world, okay, Joel, dude, this sounds good, like sitting and being with God. Like that sounds really like Disney movie-ish and like, cool. That works for you. Dude, congrats on having the time to do that. I don't, I don't have the time. My days are shorter than yours. Look, it's not, I'm not saying that it's easy. None of this is easy. But it's simple. And so often, we find that we don't have enough time in the day to abide in Christ, to be with him, and to be meeting with him and sitting with him because we're attempting to order our lives. We're attempting to order our days apart from Christ. He's saying, look, man, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will define order for you. I will define what is good and what is functional. Because every single one of you, I'm going to say this so I'm blue in the face, every one of you, look at me, look at me. Every single one of you was created with and for a purpose. And that purpose was not to be living in chaos to be living in order, good, peace-filled, joy-filled order. So if that's you this morning that you feel like, man, my life's just chaos. There's disorder, this dysfunction that's chaotic. You're not, number one, you're not alone. Uh, number two, you have a home and you, you have a safe place to talk about that here. And we wanna talk about that with you. Today, we're starting our first, first day of doing this. After every sermon now, I'm actually going to go up into the foyer there. And anybody who has questions or wants to talk or whatever after service, any questions that arise during the message, we can talk in real time right up there in the foyer. Just spend some time talking. If it's a really deep thing that's really complex and we need to meet for coffee, we can schedule that time to do that. But I encourage you, if you want to talk about this, like, let's talk. That's what I'm here for. Okay? I love you guys.